uh, this thing earlier when i had uh, uh, this thing you know uh, tried out various other things like a deeper extubation and all we had found more of airway obstruction laryngospasm all those kind of problems but i just allowed now the child to wake up on his own without stimulating and without doing anything i don't even allow any suction through the thing once you know we have stopped all anesthetics no suctioning after that nothing to be done no touch technique madam anila malde i want to ask you for the i gel you are uh, doing awake uh, extubation but what about the endotracheal tube do you practice the same thing even for endotracheal tubes see in the endotracheal tube uh also now when the patient is with the endotracheal tube generally we are paralyzing the patient when if the patient is with the supraglottic device we don't uh, paralyze the patient in our institute now so when we paralyze the patient who is with the endotracheal tube definitely after stopping all the anesthetics and we are reversing the neuromuscular blockade and we are allowing the complete awake extubation we don't do deep extubation and uh, let me confess that i'm not doing ophthalmic practice so ophthalmic practice may be little differ different but in a general pediatric anesthesia we are doing completely awake extubation in the all children with the endotracheal tube also okay uh, shall we take the other questions yeah we can One, take pertaining to this case yes Man dr manisha what shall uh, we do there are many questions but then we will have a presentation of these two speakers because the interactive discussion can go on for a long time what do you say dr okay. vaidya And one uh, question we can it. take now one now let's uh, moderators take the question later on one question we can answer yeah. more yeah the most common is question i think anita they are asking about succinylcholine use of succinylcholine after neostigmine after giving neostigmine so two three of them have asked the same question if there is a laryngospasm after extubation after giving reversal can we use succinylcholine for intubation i think that is very that has been asked by two people mm -hmm. uh if the laryngospasm has uh, usually happen after ex uh, extubation and if it is after the reversal so you have you go by the algorithm you start with your positive pressure ventilation give 100% oxygen if it is not relief you have to give succinylcholine because it's a life uh, you know life taking uh, potential of laryngospasm because hypoxia can really uh, really do uh, hazards to the child because the spasm it is a involuntary contraction of the larynx so air is not passing you are not able to ventilate it so you have to give the muscle relaxing and succinylcholine is the one that can be easily uh, you know it has a short, shorter duration of onset and action so i think uh, for according to me one can give a succinylcholine there is no problem because uh, you have to save the child at that time so dr ridima dr ridima what happens what happens when you give scolin after the reversal the the action of scolin gets a long long prolonged you know the nicotinic and muscarinic receptors are already occupied and you are giving scolin so i think it's a better to find a alternative to scolin if there are many alternatives also i think we should go to for those because once yeah. you give scolin the relaxation will uh, remain for a long long time you may have to yeah, yeah, i agree with you sir one can use a rocuronium the point is but in case if you don't have anything and at the cost of your you are losing the child you can do but rocuronium is the alternative in that case if you have availability in your ot so it has also has the same ed95 in action there are other alternatives also like you go for the opioids yes. opioids you can go for you can go for the xylocard also all this uh, preservative free lignocaine there are other alternatives also at least if you have got on the table uh, rather than giving scolin is not the safest option to go for in this patient post reversal laryngospasm so most of the time you get reversed by propofol and all that there is nothing happens so this should be your last resort i think there's a can be give if it is not getting relief by propofol lignocaine or deepening the plane then i think uh, one can go see what i i would like to comment over here is most of the time in a paralyzed child afterwards if you are doing a, uh, this uh, awake extubation we don't see that laryngospasm first of all we don't see now if at all that laryngospasm occurs the first thing is we can try out a dose of propofol most of the time that will settle if it doesn't settle 
I don't think there would be any harm to give just a small dose of 0.5 milligram per kg succinylcholine. We are not going to give our ear full dose of succinylcholine. The aim is just to relieve the spasm, wait for some time, ventilate. I think the hypoxia is the most crucial over here because we need to relieve it immediately. So I don't think, I mean, uh, there is any harm in, you know, giving a 0.5 milligram per kg succinylcholine if, if the propofolate doesn't get uh, laryngospasm doesn't come off. So we can give and then ventilate for a shorter time. So that will take care of the thing. By that time, the patient will again come out of the anesthetic effects. And then you can, uh, you know, you uh, that, that would be a better plan. So as a last resort, madam, you went to say as a last resort, only we can give scoli. And first you should try. Also, Dr. Ridima also is saying the same thing, that first you try everything else. And as a last, last resort, you can give a small dose of scoline without worrying about the phase two block because hypoxia is more dangerous and it yes. can kill the patient. If the patient has phase two block, you can ventilate the patient and take out the patient. Yeah. Dr. Nogip, sir, has to say something on this. Sir, please. Sir, unmute yourself. Sir, unmute. Unmute yourself. Please just unmute. wait, just wait, just wait. I think he exited, no? that's why the problem was there. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Bajwa. So the point I think is very clear. In case it's a partial laryngospasm, propofol around 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg works well. If it's a complete spasm with the patient desaturating, you can safely give scoline if you have an IV excess, 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg without any fear because it's a life-saving measure and you must give it in this situation. There's no doubt about that. Anita, we will proceed Thank for the next session because the point has yes. been made very clear by both the chairpersons as well yes. as faculty. Yes, yes. So this question has been answered. Yes. <laughs> so now uh, we'll go to the next uh, part and um, we'll take all these questions on laryngospasm at the end. So we are proceeding to the next session, Dr. Anita. Yes, yes. I am sharing uh, my screen. I just want to share uh, one case scenario. And um, it is just to start the discussion. It is not uh, uh, that you have to speak only on that. So uh, our first speaker, both speakers, I want to... Uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> Can you see my screen? It is visible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It... Yes. So uh, this is a one-year-old child with a head injury and has a traumatic. Um, I didn't get that. Am I audible? Yes, Anita. Very yes, audible. yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So it is a one-year-old child with a history of head injury and traumatic brain injury and he has a poor uh, Glasgow coma scale. So he's been intubated with a plain endotracheal tube in the casualty and put on ventilator. And now after six hours, the child is to be uh, explore, uh, posted for exploratory laparotomy. So uh, would you like to change the plain endotracheal tube to the cuffed endotracheal tube or keep the same tube? So this is one scenario and mind you, the scenarios are just to start the discussion on cuffed or uncuffed in various uh, uh, various case scenarios and in various places where uh, the cuffed tubes or uncuffed tubes are available or not available. The second scenario is a, a neonate with gestational age 36 weeks is posted for intuitive susception. The child has distended abdomen in spite of an esogastric tube. And I have purposefully not given the other details like the dehydration or the electrolyte imbalance disease. Because here we just want to know your opinion whether you, what will be your choice of endotracheal tube, whether a plain endotracheal tube or a cuffed endotracheal tube. And it can be any other situation, a simple uh, case of cleft palate surgery where uh, non-emergency elective case and what will be your choice, whether a cuffed tube or a non-cuffed tube. So we start with this and I request our speaker, Dr. Suman Lata, to uh, start uh, with her presentation on this topic. Though it is not a pro and con session, we want to know what you actually practically do, both the speakers, Dr. Suman Lata and uh, 
डॉक्टर राखी सो प्लीज आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर सुमन लता टू स्टार्ट आई विल स्टॉप या अनिता प्लीज स्टॉप आई विल शेयर आई विल शेयर स्क्रीन फॉर डॉक्टर सुमन लता या Yes. Can you all see now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, Doctor Suman Lata. Please start. Just tell me next so that I will share for you. Doctor Suman Lata, please. Ah, uh, madam, please unmute yourself. Doctor Suman Lata. Otherwise, if uh, she has accidentally logged out, we can take Dr. Rakhi. Dr. Rakhi's presentation yeah. first. Yeah. Okay. Let me stop sharing then. I'll just check what has happened to her. Yeah. So I request Dr. Rakhi Goel, Madam, to please start sharing her screen and start with her presentation. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible and you can see my slide. Yes. So, so the entire debate on cuffed versus uncuffed endotracheal tube in children is the debate over. My answer is just a three-letter word: absolutely yes. Now, the case scenario uh, which was just put up for us was of uh, the first one: the one-year-old head injury on ventilator for an um, laparotomy. now the answer is very obvious here it has to be i mean if if given a choice you know there are very the many limitations but given a choice i would definitely go for a cuffed endotracheal tube in a, a one year old child now uh, i'll just go through some of the points which would tell you why i made that choice now we all know that historically uh, the accepted wisdom was to use uncuffed tubes till about 8 years of age now the funny part is that it was based on very limited technology which was in 1897 by beaux where you know the plaster of paris castings the moulages of uh, cadaveric larynx were used and just in 15 children where the age was from 4 months to 14 years now based on this the concept that uh, the pediatric larynx is uh, funnel shaped and the narrowest part is the cricoid that was the basis and it kept getting replicated this concept went on for years and decades till now they faced you know last 2 3 decades they faced the actual reality the understanding of anatomy changed based on ct based on mri bronchoscopies that the pediatric airway is cylindrical the narrowest part could be glottis or subglottis the cricoid would be the most rigid part because it cannot distend unlike the glottis and subglottis but here the most important thing is that the cricoid is not circular it is elliptical and the anterior posterior diameter is more than the transverse diameter now this part is proven now this changes our whole understanding of using cuffed or uncuffed tubes now you see uh, here so this is the ap diameter this is longer than the transverse diameter and this is the yellow part is the endotracheal tube so you see the black portions here up and down these portions are left out the pressure here on the two sides showed by the red arrows could be more on the tracheal mucosa whereas the upper and lower portions are left out you know a leak left out for leaks now here on the right side if a cuff tube is used of a size smaller than the uncuffed tubes this the green area is covered by the cuff you know so so the coverage of the trachea is definitely better by a cuffed endotracheal tube now we'll come to pressures also here the pressures could be high when we use a micro cuff the pressure here the pressure exerted by the cuff would not be as high as 
the tracheal pressure on the by the tube itself now in the last in the first decade when the concept of cuff tube came the problem was uh, they just put a cuff on a normal endotracheal tube now that was not enough that's why the initial studies uh, did not find uh, much difference in fact everybody had uh, um, a lot of resistance to change that why should we use a cuff tube everything was good with a uncuff tube over the years the cuffed endotracheal tubes design changed it became better first the quality of cuff the diameter and shape of cuff so a micro cuff an ultra thin micro cuff of just 10 microns placed very distally with no murphy eye with the proper depth marking you know the even the size i'll show you this now this this was a typical cuff and now the cuff is shorter more uh, cylindrical more distal to the tip towards the tip and no murphy eye because there is actually no place for murphy eye and this is designed so that the cuff should neither obstruct a bronchus nor the vocal cords now you know imagine the trachea of a very small child it's very small if you have a bigger cuff it will obstruct either of the two places a bronchus or the vocal cords and we don't want that so uh, it's very important that we understand what kind of cuff you are using if you're using a cuffed endotracheal tube and then the marking now some of the cuff tubes which are actually to be used they have a proper depth marking where the moment you cross the black mark you stop you know, so this is very important to understand when you use the most important part is measuring the cuff pressure this is a typical micro cuff endotracheal tube size 3 and we need to measure the cuff if you use especially if you're using nitrous oxide along with oxygen with a lot of institutes still do so there the cuff pressures may increase phenomenally and cause tracheal injury so now we have to understand why we are talking so much about this uh, leak and seal uh, which is created by the cuff if the seal is too loose if the tube or the cuff is too loose what happens one aspiration that we know second to my mind the important thing is a lot of uh, leakage of the fresh gas flows so you have to use a very high fresh gas flow which also takes away your inhalational agent so the patient is inhaling less and probably we are inhaling more then the monitoring the tidal volume becomes very unreliable if there's a leak the edco2 is unreliable the ventilation distribution is unreliable you don't know the peep you are giving is it going not going and you will end up with atelectasis even while putting the tube when you put uncuffed tube unless you have a good experience you would probably be using a you know reintubating a couple of times to get the right size tube in place so a lot of airway instrumentation may may happen i would say. now this is when the tube is loose now if the tube is tight i'm talking about the uncuffed tube a tight tube causing pressure on the tracheal mucosa in a small child whose uh, perfusion pressure is way less than the adult can cause at the least post of sore throat and a grave uh, adverse event like strider or tracheal stenosis so we need to have a tube which is not too tight and not too loose and there comes the utility of a good cuff now uh, people say that in a spontaneously breathing child uh, there'll be a lot of resistance if we use a size smaller tube with a cuff now as we just discussed in uh, you know pertaining to the previous case that if you're putting a tube you will give a relaxant you will manually ventilate just just towards the end before extubation the child would be breathing spontaneously so putting a smaller tube and increasing the resistance is not really making much difference now this is what is uh, the limiting factor is probably the cost and the availability now availability is getting sorted because more and more proper cuff tubes are available in children at least uh, in the cities i've worked i've never had a problem but yes the cost is almost three times and and sometimes it may be more but 
the kind of uh, gas wastage, the number of tubes that you have discarded, the risk of aspiration. If you see these things, I would find a cuff tube cheaper. This is, uh, I, I thought I'll put all the points together, you know, so, so that you understand the difference between a cuffed and the um, uncuffed tube. Now, um, we've already talked about it. So ultimately, I would say that you should use a cuff tube in children. And the recommendation is for more than three kgs of weight and a full term child, baby or child. But my personal take home to you would when you're using a cuffed endotracheal tube in a child, use it wisely. Use the correct cuff, you know, the correct size, uh, and uh, do not increase the harm by just blindly using a cuff tube because that's the recommendation. You know, so so that's my uh, real um, advice to everyone. Thank you. I have a lot of uh, references, but I'll skip it. I'll use them uh, as and when required. Thank you. Dr. Sumanlata, are you there? Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, there. Yeah. I'll share the screen for you. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah, you can start now. Yeah, good evening everyone and uh, happy World Yoga Day to everyone. <laughs> and we'll start uh, already, Dr. Raki has uh, done all the homework for me. So my work becomes very easy. Uh, uh, Ma'am, next slide. Just the neck so that it will become easy for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like uh, I, I, I'm concentrating more on the cuff, uh, uncuffed tube. So as uh, always, it has been told that periodic airway is a funnel shape and narrowest part was a cricoid cartilage. This was a recommendation which we always had in mind. Unless that uh, new uh, investigations came in play, the uh, recommendation to use uncuffed tube was to uncuff tube large enough to seal at the level of the cricoid ring, but allows air leak between 20 to 30 centimeter of water for the adequate uh, positive pressure ventilation without damaging the tracheal mucosa from the excessive pressure and re reduces the incidence of tracheal stenosis. So if you place a cuff, uncuffed tube, you see in this diagram that uh, the uncuffed tube just crosses the narrowest part of the cricoid cartilage and sits there. So it reduces the glottic injury compared to the cuff tube, reduces incidence of post extubation strider, and larger diameter, it is easy for the suction, less prone to block it, and reduces the airway. So, but in the recent studies, after all the newer uh, investigations have come in a way, the, the periodic airway is uh, told that it is an elliptical shape airway at the level of cricoid cartilage, potentially the vulnerable to damage even from a properly sealed uncuffed tube. That means the circular tube when, uh, will occlude the elliptical airway only on the sides, leaving a gap anterior and posterior side. Leak tests done routinely to make sure that the tube is not too big may actually show leak but there may be excessive pressure on the transverse walls of the trachea. So the ventilation leak around the tube, even if the uncuffed tube uh, appears to be correct size, is acceptable before surgery commences. With ongoing neuromuscular blockade and changing depth of anesthesia, an excessive leak may become apparent only after surgery has started. And it has been seen that multiple attempts to find the appropriate size endotracheal tube also is a concern. And if you see this diagram, there's no uniformity in the marking. Uh, all different companies are showing different marking from the tube. Even one tube, you can see till the adapter, the marking is there. And the, in the cuff tube, you can see that the marking of the to place also is different for the different tube. So we don't know actually uh, what will work with which patient. Inaccurate capnography tracing happens like in an uh, uncuffed tube. Inaccurate spirometric tidal volume measurement can happen. Inaccurate tidal volume anesthetic level measurement and waste uh, increases the cost of the inhalating agent. 
increases pollution of the opening room environment and increases air with fire. So the lack of ability to regulate the trachea seal with change in respiratory system compliance increases the risk of microaspiration too. So airway injury, oversized tube, undue pressure on the cricoid mucosa, undersized tube, tube movements, all these are concerned. So these are my reference. And with all this message, my main concern is the size which is, which is you're expecting that it is fit for the uh, tube, but in the two ways where anterior and posterior space which is left out, the posterior, the tube with, in a supine position lies on the posterior uh, side and anterior space leaves for the leak. So posterior size, if the pressure comes very high, then it is uh, micro uh, in, uh, ischemic injury starts. And if the duration is longer, so you, you don't know what is the outcome on later on that comes only when the patient is extubated and uh, in a child you cannot say that this is a thro so throat or this. so all these th things come very later but still on the whole uh, it depends on the individual uh, patient which we are taking and the, uh, at that moment what was your decision and what were your clinical findings uh, on the extubation or intubation can take a decision so cuff versus uncuff is totally a very big debate which cannot be solved, I think. And uh, it depends on the uh, availability also and institutions also. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suman. Uh, uh, actually, one of the speakers uh, said about the pro and the other is con. So it looks like as if the debate is continued. But let us talk to the chairpersons and the other people Adam. who are expert into this field and let us see what is the solution and what do we recommend to the uh, public at large. So I ask, um, I request Dr. Anila Ma'am to please uh, tell her practices, share her practices, her um, uh, availability of the tubes at your place and the other concerns associated with this debate. Uh, yeah, uh, see, uh, now, in, I'm working in a municipal uh, general hospital, so it is obviously for, uh, funded by the municipal corporation, it means basically it's a government institution. Limited availability of the uh, microcuff tubes. Yeah, in between there was a problem from the microcuff tube side also. When now the problem is solved. So basically what I do in our practice is wherever there is decrease in the thoracic compliance or increase in the airway resistance is expected for medicinal obstruction, intersusception, all sorts of abdominal distinction or thoracic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, video-assisted thoracoscopic surgeries. So this kind of uh, surgeries or prone position, uh, uh, this. So there we are using microcuff tubes. Now, simple surgery, because the surgery is of a longer duration in a teaching institute, suppose a complicated hypospedias repair is there, which is going to take two and a half to three hours. There, when we are putting uh, endotracheal tube, we are getting away even with the ordinary tube. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yes, ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah, audible, so, very much audible. So we are, we because of the cost factor, moment still the microcuff tubes are at least four to five times costlier than the plain endotracheal tube. It become it is uh, on the lesser side. So we are where we are going to have a lesser thoracic compliance, higher airway resistance, intestinal obstructions, patient at risk of full stomach. All these cases we are definitely using microcuff tubes. Okay, and the other cases, peripheral surgeries, surgeries like hypospedias. We are getting with the getting away with the plain endotracheal tubes, and uh, Dr. Raki Goel has uh, said in her uh, lecture that you know it has to be used wisely. So obviously, the as she has very very correctly mentioned, the right kind of uh, cuff tubes. 
So microcuff at the moment is the best one. So right kind of the cuff tubes, proper monitoring of the cuff pressures, proper inflation. See, when you are using a smaller microcuff tubes, like for example, three number, 3.5 number, you need to inflate the cuff with the one ml syringe because at times you just require 0.1 to 0.3 ml air. So it is better that we are inflating the cuff with the uh, using uh, one ml syringe in a very graduated manner, continuous uh, monitoring of the cuff pressure. And earlier people used to say, yes, the cuff will get inflated, cuff pressure will increase. But even if when we are not using nitrous oxide, when we are using oxygen air, then also the cuff pressure slowly over a period of time, it increases. And the mechanism is that because the you have inflated the cold air and when it comes in contact with the body temperature, the at that temperature, the air that whatever is there in the cuff is going the contact with the body temperature, okay? So obviously the cuff pressure can rise over a period of time. So continuous monitoring of cuff pressure is very, very important and it required we have to do regular deflations also, okay? And one more very important thing is that never put a too tight micro cuff tube and then keep it deflated because when we are putting that uh, inflating the cuff it forms the folds okay and it is less with the micro cuff tube but still it is always better to put a 0.5 size smaller compared to the uncuffed tube so we use motoyama's formula that is age upon 4 plus 3.5 for the selection of micro cuff tube and when we are selecting plain tubes we use modified Cole's formula that is age upon four plus four. And of course we have to obviously check and nowadays now most of our anesthesia workstations have a pressure volume loops. So we can always make out whether there is any leak. Okay, so apart from audible leak, if you are keeping that spirometry on with the pressure volume loop, you know that the cuff is leaking, then accordingly, obviously we need to inflate the thing. Yeah, yeah, I hope that suffices. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anila, ma'am. Uh, I request Seti, sir, yes, uh, to please uh, give your inputs. Absolutely, yeah. ma'am. Uh, that was very well spoken. Uh, as Dr. Rakhi and Dr. Anila and Dr. Suman have brought out very correctly, it's very safe now to use a cuffed tube above the neonatal age. Cost notwithstanding. Only thing is very important is it has to be sighted correctly. That is between the cricoid and the carina. That is very important. The second thing is, and uh, since all the, it's only a few micro cuff tubes, which are really micro cuffs. We have to make sure that you choose a good quality tube. And the second point is that it has to be monitored constantly, the cuff pressure, because invariably it rises as ma'am has very correctly brought out. So at least every hour you must check for the pressure. That's why above the neonatal age, I think it's a good idea to use the micro cuff tube correctly cited and correctly placed. And in the neonatal age group, as of now, since uh, there is uh, less of evidence, it's probably safer to use the uncuffed tube unless you have the correct micro cuff tube readily available. It's probably safer in neonates you know, because uh, the level of evidence as we have now is above three kg. Right, sir. Um so I think it is now very clear and the cuffed endotracheal tubes when to use is uh, it has to be chosen wisely. The recommendations are there. It is not a time to say no, no to the cuffed endotracheal tube. So I think uh, uh, we can take up the chat, bo uh, chat box questions. Anything else, Dr. Manishri? Uh, uh, are the two scenarios answered? I think they're not answered yet. Uh, so, yeah, you can yeah. continue answering that. You can continue, yes. Yeah. So the first one I said definitely a cuff too, because for reasons clearly, because one, uh, it's a head injury on ventilator, it's the baby is going to be on ventilator for some time. So there is no question of not using a cuff tube. Um, 
for all the reasons, you know, for monitoring, for aspiration, for uh, preventing tracheal ischemia and stenosis, stridor, and so on. Um, and and uh, tra tracheal cuff pressure monitoring must be done. So that's undisputed. Now, the second one I'm more interested is, it's a 36 weeker, the way it's not given. And um, that's for intersusception, a liprotomy, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. So now uh, there are studies where uh, cuffed endotracheal tube size three, because less than size three is not available, has been used in uh, neonates preterms uh, from two kgs to three kgs. And they have found that more than 2.7 kg, there have been absolutely no problems. It's been used in NICU. However, that's just one study and very limited evidence. So as Sethi sir said, that you should know what you're doing, basically. Just don't put in a cuff tube because you heard the webinar and uh, you heard the recommendation that you should use a cuff tube. So it can be used. If I have a micro cuff and I have the cuff pressure monitor, in the second case also, I may choose to use a cuff tube. If I see the baby 36 weeker is, you know, um, around three kgs, but if the baby is two kgs, 2.5, I would prefer a uncuffed tube. I think that is one message we all should be very clear with, that when to use uncuffed, when you can, if you don't have a cuffed tube, can you use an uncuffed? And what all precautions you should take both ways. And, and uh, then there would be no debate. Uh, yeah, Anita, thank you. Anita, I just I wanted some... to make it clear from Dr. Rakhi, when she's saying cuffed, is it a PVC cuff or a micro cuff tube? Micro cuff. Cuffed, cuff tube is micro cuff. Yes. So that is that it's message. Not has to a cuff on a tube. Yeah. So <laughs> In that message is has not just a cuff yeah. is put on an endotracheal tube and we call it cuff. No. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that... Without a cuff. Without a micro cuff tube and a pressure monitor, you're not justified to place a cuff tube. Yeah, that was sir. I also because there's a lot of issue regarding uh, other than micro cuff, all other cuff tubes they give you a lot of problem. Absolutely. And the, yes. and the dra dragging of the tube over the uh, uh, vocal cord is the biggest thing which uh, uh, causes all the post complications. Post yes. complications. Very, so, very correctly said, <laughs> Suman Lata, madam. So, yeah, let's make it very clear that it is micro soft cuff tube and yes. not the PVC cuff tube. It, if it is a micro cuff, then only you must use oh. the tube. And if it is a portex or any other PVC cuff tube, then it is better to use a plain tube. Yeah, it is equal to uncuff tube only. Absolutely. Yes. Great uh, uh, hospitals take a lot of things for granted. Yeah, ma'am. Because uh, some people have asked a very basic question. Uh, because many people may not uh, have been regularly using. So just it's a little repetition, but I think we, we need to make it very clear to them. Uh, somebody has put up in a chat box, basically they want to know what is the difference between a normal and a micro cuff tube. So first of all, uh, so-called normal tube, when we are talking, that cuff is made up of polyvinyl chloride. Whereas micro cuff tube, it is made up of polyurethane. Okay. And a polyurethane is much less reactive to the mucosa compared to the polyvinyl chloride. That's the first difference. Secondly, a normal PVC cuff, the thickness is anywhere between 30 to 50 micrometer. Whereas in a micro cuff tube, the thickness is only 5 to 10 micrometer. Okay. The third difference is the micro cuff tube, the cuff is a cylindrical, whereas in a PVC tube, the cuff is quite globular. So if you keep both the tubes side by side and if you inflate and check it out, you yourself will understand that that globular cuff, which is the quite thick, more chances of fold formation is there. It is more going to be damaging to the mucosa compared to the micro cuff tube. There are studies with the micro cuff tubes. The seal pressures with the micro cuff tubes are only about 10 millimeters mercury. Now, this is very, very important because the neonatal mucosa is going to be very sensitive. Unlike an adult mucosa, which will tolerate about 25 millimeters mercury pressure, the neonate and infant's blood pressure itself 
is quite less. So in an adult where the mean arterial pressure is about 100 millimeters mercury, the mean arterial pressure in a 37-week baby would be 37. So obviously this baby is not going to tolerate any higher cuff pressure. Then one more important thing is that in a normal PVC tube, the cuffs are quite long. And because there is a, between the tip and the uh, distal portion of the cuff, there's a Murphy eye. So it is a proximally placed cuff. Now, why we were always afraid of the cuff was that inflated cuff should not be lying at the subglotic region because that's the most vulnerable part. And that is the part which is going to get damaged. So the cuff has to go beyond the subglotis region. Okay, so at least beyond the glottis, about a centimeter or so, in a, even in infant, has to be free. So unless the cuff is more distally placed, that's not going to be possible. So that is the difference between the micro cuff and the normal cuff tube. So it is very important that you always check the thing. And if you uh, will uh, see the cuff, it is of a micro cuff tube, it's a very, very smooth. So you can, by just visual look also, you will realize that this cuff is not going to cause the damage to the mucosa. Whereas a normal PVC cuff, which is a thick one, is going to cause a damage to the mucosa. And even the depth marker, it has to be appropriately placed. If you will take a five number PVC endotracheal tube with the cuff and a five number micro cuff tube, you will realize the depth markers are quite proximal in the PVC. So many times, if you go by depth marker and if you are putting the uh, tube, there would be uh, higher chances of doing an endobronchial intubation. And if you are keeping it more proximally out, then the cuff will be inflating at the subglotic region and it will be damaging the subglotis. So you are going to cause more harm. So in that case, it is anyway better to put a uncuffed tube rather than having a, mm. uh, this kind of thing. Okay. Mm. One, one word I want to say, if you're using uncuffed tube, allow some leak. Yeah. Allow a bit Definitely. of leak. Definitely. I think, uh, you know, at 20, 25 centimeter of water airway pressure, there should be a bit of leak. Yeah. Don't try to put too tight an uncuffed tube uh, with the insecurity that there is no cuff. So you should put a tight tube uh, to prevent aspiration. Yeah. Yeah. You will lose tidal volume. You will lose uh, your monitoring benefits. But... Uh, the local ischemia will not be there. So I would prefer to use a slightly loose. Uh, yeah, uncovered. definitely. Yeah, uh, that is okay. But then we have to be very careful that the tube is not dragged over the grotic opening when we are uncuffed moving. The Un we're talking yeah. about uncuffed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still uncuffed also. Mm -hmm. If it drags over the grotic uh, thing, it really causes a lot of injury. And in pediatric, it is very difficult to assess in the post of what has happened. One yeah. more very important thing is when we are keeping a baby on a ventilator on the post-operative period. Now, when the baby starts having a good spontaneous efforts and if the baby tries to cry on the tube, what happens with the spontaneous uh, respiration, the trachea is also moving up and down. So with that, the cuff also, if it is too much inflated, it can become injurious. So whenever the baby starts, you know, trying vigorously on the tube and you have not yet removed the, you have not yet planned to remove the endotracheal tube, it is better to partially deflate the cuff. That precaution has to be taken. Otherwise, with that endotracheal, means with the tracheal movement, it becomes quite injurious. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Manisha, shall I say something? Yes, sir. Actually, what we are planning here is... Uh, the information to the many of the anesthesiologists who are working in the peripheries. Absolutely right, micro cuff tubes are not so easily available in those peripheries. And choosing a cuffed or uncuffed, I think uh, Dr. Raki also said, Neela Manam also said, choosing an uncuffed tube in the peripheries when you are getting the neonates or the infants operated, it's always better to use an uncuffed tube with a slight leak, but the packing can be done very effectively. Yeah. You can always, even in the cuff tube, na, when you are using the PVC cuff tube, 
you cannot ensure the aspiration the channeling is always there because the cuff will not take the shape of the trachea as against the micro cuff that plus the pressures point at certain points of mucosa will be much higher as compared to other points just because the shape of the trachea is still forming here so better to use uncuffed tube in the periphery the message which i which i got from the discussion till now plus good packing i think there is a method of putting the uh, pharyngeal packs posterior to the tube and with that you can almost prevent 80% of the aspiration silent aspiration because when the kids get lighter the secretions and other things or even the bleeding part also if, if occur during uh, oral surgery the chances of aspiration gets minimized so uh, i think the whatever the practitioners feel safe micro cuff tube i think still not available in the peripheries i don't think so if we get a survey also done we will not be able to get that thing definitely the debate is between the cuffed and the uncuffed but the cuff give us pseudo feeling here so better to go for the uncuffed and the leak in the especially in the uh, neonates and the infants yeah uh, uh, yeah uh, that's a very good point dr bajwa uh, only uh, only thing i would like to just mention uh, here is when you don't use a pack routinely when you use a uncuffed tube the pack to be used only where there is a risk of aspiration because it causes a lot of trauma and uh, the child has a a uh, severe sore throat for days afterwards yeah because the pad really causes severe sore throat so where you suspect an aspiration definitely yeah, less we don't suspect an aspiration don't needlessly use a pad dr bajwa i would use a throat pack only if it is a oral, oral or surgery, surgery. Oral surgery. Or one question was there ma'am position otherwise uh, i would not use the pack because you know uh children are not going to be able to tell you that what exactly is the problem they'll be keeping they will completely keep crying in the post operative period and you don't know that uh, this may be the cause you know so it's better not to uh, pack the thing yes. unless it's a oral or nasal surgery where uh, the we are afraid of blood uh, going into the uh, trachea and the that's why a good debate ma'am this is a debate actually required for these thing in the peripheries and the institution yes. we we have got so many gadgets so many monitors yes. so many things but in the peripheries the person is alone and is confused what to do what not to do how to go about that particular surgery so many things are there in the peripheries so yes. that's the reason we have to satisfy the yeah. queries and there is a very 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 good question there the i think one should take up that the fracture of mandible we want to go for the pediatric bronchoscope is not there want to go for the blind nasal with the coronary and sugama rex I think that's a very good question. You can uh, anybody can take that question. Yeah, sir, we'll be taking up all the questions in the chat box. We were so much engrossed into the discussion going on, and it's such a wonderful discussion. Actually, the purpose is met because uh, I think the message is now across that yes, we need to use the cuffed endotracheal tube very judiciously. Of course, it is not a no, but at the periphery is where the resource limitation is there. Uh, the message is that uh, uncuffed endotracheal tube. if not proper is uh, a cuffed endotracheal tube if it is not micro cuff is uh, not a good option and you can go for a uncuffed endotracheal tube throat pack we have already discussed when to use how to use and all the relevant points have already Another been discussed thing which dr ridhima i just wanted to tell is like uh, generally what periphery we cases where are done and are a short duration so this uh, uncuffed uh, tracheal tube is good enough if uh, it is done uh, the case is done because they in periphery so not a very long duration cases are there where we are uh, like worried that how will we will leave the patient on tube or we have to put on ventilators so uh, generally they are, they are short procedures so when we are talking of the cuff done cuff this debate only comes when we are doing some big cases and Uh, uh, duration of surgery is prolonged. Post-op ventilation is required. And uh, another very important point is when you fix a tube, any tube, uh, cuffed or uncuffed, the angle at the mouth should be uh, where every movement with child, because child is a small child, and every uh, movement which is done, it comes the effect comes on the tube. So that uh, taking care the at the angle of mouth where the tube is fixed. it makes a lot of difference and uh, it uh, pre, uh, it's a uh, like safety precaution when you are uh, even if you just hold the tube there if some movements are happening on the table it helps a lot 
yeah. and why yeah. intubate every child put your supraglottic airways minimize tube use anyways yeah. that's correct but sometimes even in a peripheral setup a surgery like a orthopedic surgery suppose there is a lower limb surgery or uh, as i said earlier a complicated hypospadia and all they are taking some time so if it is uh, two two and a half hour surgery many times we don't put a supraglottic device in a longer duration surgery but this surgery is not involving the body cavities there's no chance of increasing in the airway resistance or decrease in the thoracic compliance and all that so here if you have a limited resources you can get away with the plain tubes so even in our government setups also in a big city like mumbai also we are quite judicious at the present moment because the cost is definitely higher so we are judiciously using as i said earlier thank you so much ma'am yeah a question yeah. on the behalf of all the private practitioners uh, especially for uh, the case scenario one where we are discussing about uh, craniotomy maybe a extradural hematoma and the surgery is going to get over in 45 minutes a 2 year old child posted for ex, uh, removal of extradural hematoma in a peripheral setup because all neurosurgery cases are usually done in small setups also so yeah. here i don't i have uncuffed tubes but at the same time i have pvc cuff tubes what should be my choice of using the tubes so this is I a common question cuff tube in that case yes cuff tube same yeah. uncuffed uncuffed if you don't have a micro cuff then use uncuffed yeah. okay yeah, that's right there is no point using yeah. a a yeah. bad cuff tube which yeah. can okay. harm yeah. for sake of harm your child cuff tube. for sake no, of no. using yeah. a cuff tube yeah. uh, a cortex or a uh, any cuff tube if you look at the cuff design itself you will realize it is so bad that it keeps tugging onto the cords If the cuff is so long that either it is endobronchial or it is tugging onto the cords. So if it is micro cuff, then only you should use cuff tubes. Otherwise, no other cuff tube because it is practically impossible to keep the tube in the center between the carina and the cords. Anita, yeah. madam, I am scared of that that the tube may get that the tube may come out intraoperatively and the the, the drapings are there over the face and head. So I am scared that the tube may come out. During the surgery, if I'm putting in the, yes, the maybe the stop manufacturers it. will stop making. Manufacturers will stop making them also. If yes. we don't use these ones, the manufacturers will stop making them eventually. So the message has to go that for babies, yes, precious, yes. we yes. need to yes, have sir. the correct tube. Yes. Absolutely yes. right. Very correct. Very correct, sir. If you pull and out the cuff right. tube, if you pull out a cuff tube, which is a Portex cuff tube, even if it is cuffed, it can come out. You know, if you tug at it. Yes. So you need to fix the tube properly. The uh, idea is not to use cuff tubes to prevent the accidental extubation. You must uh, actually fix it properly. Yes. You can stitch it. You can take a stitch at the side if you are worried that the fa whole face will be covered. But uh, the idea is uh, the from this forum it should go that the micro cuff tube should be used. And uh, see, the surgeon is using such costly equipments. Yeah. So the micro cuff tube, I'll tell you, it is costing fourteen hundred rupees per tube. and uh, you can reuse it you can do eto you can do uh, saline and soap water cleaning and do it you can re reuse it so anita uh, ma'am eto is not available in the periphery is not yes. available micro cup not available i'm telling you nobody no clinic will give 1400 rupees for the micro cup tube to the anesthesiologist uh, yes. rather than using so. and even the this cup tube they gives a false sense of security that the tube will not get dislodged it gives a false sense of security that the aspiration will not occur these are all false things if you go by yes, the literature yes. there are chances of aspiration with the uh, this one uh, cup tube also uh, accidental extubation many time when the you are doing the craniotomy whether it's a cup tube or it's a uncuffed tube accidental extubation can happen any time whenever the head is rotated for the drain of hematoma can't guarantee you that accident uh, so these things are very difficult in the periphery is very difficult and uh, dr manisha will be uh, alone there and who will be helping her if something happens like that ex accidental extubation and laryngospasm together so yes. those things are difficult to manage in that scenario <laughs> see when in our center till now for a craniotomy in a 2 year old child we have been using uncuffed tubes okay in our own center also which is a very big center 
okay still we are using uncuffed tube uh in so it can be safely used if things are not available uncuffed tube can be safely used okay yeah we've been using it for last 50 years actually ma'am yes so it can be so only now that you know with progress and now yes. that you have an option yeah so whenever last 10 years only things available we should try for putting a cuff tube only whenever option is available slowly we have to convince everybody in the administration also to give sufficient funds absolutely but when it is done we can yeah. definitely continue with the uncuff tube it's not to be yeah. completely and uh, sort of discarded types not at all uh, neela ma'am one question for you yeah you have been practicing anesthesia for more than 40 years um 33 years 34 okay. years more than 30 years same is yeah. with navdeep sir also now tell me honestly in the last 30 years how many incidences of aspiration you have seen with uncuffed tube how many accidental extubation you have seen with the uncuffed tube as compared to the cuff tube how many complications you have seen with uncuffed tube how much discomfort you have seen with uncuffed tube in, yeah. in you have 30 years forget yeah. about anything in the literature go don't go with lancet or a and a nothing in your so, subjective experience yeah so see incident by large it's been very safe but then we are not studying it you know we are not studying each and every case from that aspect so there may be many patients who uh, we may be thinking yaar kuch nahi hua but they may be having you know subtle aspirations or they may be having so throat for days on end but having said that the uncuffed tube has stood the test of time as a relatively safe entity yeah personally very we have experienced very few complications if i should put it that way uh even i would agree uh, i have seen three to four cases of aspiration in this many years okay but unlike adult children are much more resilient the effect of aspiration in adults also i have seen over this many years in children also i have seen but children do come out very fast i mean they do come out of that yeah. even if i mean recently about 2 3 months back also uh, child had a meal which uh, you know even mother had not uh, uh, mother also had pre operatively denied child did aspirate we had a proper pneumonitic patch and all but the still recovery is very fast in the children so unlike adult the similar case in an adult would have a, you know days together ventilation and then would have come off but children are much more resilient luckily in that particular uh, uh, case so incidence is definitely low of aspiration in children plus they are more resilient the effect of that aspiration pneumonitis is not as bad as in the adults and, and dr asit vaishnav sir is saying a 43 year of his life in experience is an anesthesia he has not seen a single case of aspiration in the uncuffed tube so these thing also matter the senior people watching this thing and they are doing this and what we are also uh, i have got a 25 years of practice of anesthesia at least i have not seen many cases of laryngospasm with the uncuffed tube as compared with the cuff tube that the cuff itself causes a good laryngospasm just we are preventing for the aspiration just thinking that aspiration will be prevented but opposite side we have got more of a laryngospasm because the many questions are being asked about the pressure monitor the difference between the pressure monitors for the adults and the uh, kids honestly speaking i have never used the pressure monitor in my life I have not seen it i have seen it but i have not used it very very honestly i'm saying so i don't know how many centers in india are really using the cup pressure manometer i really don't uh, know yes, sir uh, one question in the warning, ICU, one question of warning sir in a children even if you are using micro cuff tube please do not use without using cup pressure monitors please do not use it i think i would like to give a strict warning to everybody in adults yes years together we have not used cup pressure monitor these days also still we are not using cup pressure monitor in the adults regularly but children do need to monitor cup pressures when you are using a cuff tube and especially if you are using for a longer time i have done myself there compared to uncuffed and cuffed endotracheal tube we have serially monitored the cup pressures even in a surgery of 1 1 and 1/2 hour or 2 hours duration also 
yeah. then these we do require in, deflations absolutely. of the cup because as i said earlier also even if you are not using nitrous oxide also with the just temperature change the cup pressure does increase yeah. okay yeah. plus yeah. another this thing a uh, warning to everybody please do not use 2 or a 5 ml syringe for inflating micro uh, tubes please use a 1 ml syringe do a gradual cuff inflation okay it requires hardly because when we have done a proper project we can realize that how much small amount it is requiring in a three number tube it hardly requires 0.1 0.2 at the most 0.3 ml air would you be able to give 0.3 ml air with a 2 cc or 5 cc syringe so similarly the cuff pressure has to come into use when and it's not very costly even a regular cuff pressure monitors are costing 15 20000 and if you are using it carefully i think you can use for a more than a decade or one and a half yeah. decade also this cuff pressure monitors so it should be used yeah ma'am in fact uh, we are using routinely for all our cases in the operation theater as well as icu i mean a corporate setup not withstanding it's safest to use it in all patients i think ma'am because the educated hand is not really very educated when you are inflating and you can't really tell you know by the feel of the cuff how much air you have inflated invariably you will find you are heading 40 50 60 cm of water so uh, we need to use the pressure monitor more regularly if we can there are many questions in the chat box actually the questions for the first topic also are there So, yeah. uh, please go ahead with that. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead with that. Yes, the one yeah, question. Yes, we can go ahead with the questions. Yes, nebulization with what? Uh, the question has been asked. Uh, in case of laryngospasm, you nebulize with which drug? Doctor Ridhima. Doctor Ridhima. Yeah, one can do atria nebulization, and I don't know what this question is projecting after laryngospasm or what, because laryngospasm is an emergency. so you if you are suspecting or uh, like post op you can do uh, with the area nebulization that can prevent the edema and everything otherwise so i think uh, pre operatively if you want to you can do plignocaine area nebulization if you are suspecting like in my case if you have noticed a child has a passive smoker you are i for more than 4 weeks so there is a chances one can keep in mind that this child may go into laryngospasm and all these precautions can be taken so this adrenaline nebulization how will you dilute madam you can dilute it in a 5 ml okay one ampule in 5 ml okay and then directly put in the nebulizer okay and another question to you only dr ridhima can you explain the artificial cuff test for extubation yeah so artificial uh, in artificial uh, cuff test one single lung inflation with 100% oxygen immediately before the removal of et is done it delays uh, or prevents the desaturation or also uh, expels the residual secretions uh, in the airway and decreases the potential of spasm so basically you have to put a positive pressure uh, before you are just taking out the tube okay yeah. so is this uh, what is the reference for this dr ridhima have you ever done that Yeah, ma'am. It is there in the PJ journal, British Journal of yeah. Anesthesia, and in with that uh, algorithm, they have described it. This artificial cuff maneuvering. So they have written yeah. it like that: the uh, lung inflation with high hundred percent oxygen immediately before the removal of the EGT. Mm -hmm. So they just to delay, take the secretion, dissipate the secretion because the most common cause of laryngospasm can be secretions or yeah. blood in the vicinity of the cords. Yeah, it's like uh, Doctor Sapna. If you remember, in the for babies, you know, when we extubate, we inflate the lungs, hold the bag, and then extubate. So yeah. the lungs are filled, you know, with the oxygen, and the child instead of sucking in, coughs out. Right, Doctor Nita, can you take up the next question? Yes, yes. There are too many questions. Yeah, yeah. We'll just go. Many of them are answered also. Yeah. Yes, sir. The okay. Now, the questions will never end. Questions will never end. I'm telling you. Yes. Uh, we'll at Sub least answer. You can pull up to 10 p.m. easily. <laughs> Now the questions are on the cuff and stick. 
I think we go one by one for the questions. Huh. Somebody has asked best induction agent. Would it be propofol or ketamine? Sometimes confused. Hmm. Hmm. I would say if you are keeping laryngospasm in mind, the propofol is the agent of best in, uh, agent to be done. It avoids uh, spasm, and ketamine might increase the secretion, and you know you can have a chances more chances likelihood. And it's all about all over uh, overall, you know. Uh, holistic approach to your uh, to your uh, induction agents but as far as laryngospasm is concerned i'll say uh, propofol yes ma'am anila ma'am and sir can city sir can say yeah uh, i agree totally propofol would be the choice okay next question is severe laryngospasm not relieved with succinylcholine 1 mg per kg ippv diff becomes difficult in such cases to break such cycle plan b plan c should also be ready. Uh, severe yeah, laryngospasm. Actually, that successful. discussion already over with that. I would think it was going with Dr. Chavda, madam. Mm -hmm. Actually, the problem is, uh, what I want to say, suppose there is an etiology which is continuously causing the laryngospasm post-extubation. Mm -hmm. Either it's better to remove the etiology yeah, the rather than mm -hmm. landing up into the scolene and IPPV in those cases. Suppose mm -hmm. any hematoma or small thing happening in, around the trachea or around the larynx, Something like that. Any foreign body there, at least we have to see the positive factor. That plan B has to be there to remove the etiology so that to repeat the, uh, so to prevent the rep repetitive laryngospasm. That was the thing. Discussion already done on that, I think. In the chat box, the discussion completed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. I think you can move on the second topic. Yeah. Is there any role of xylocard nebulization? Uh, this we is have already discussed, no? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Somebody has question. asked any role of USG for appropriate endotracheal tube size and placement. Yes, yes USG has a role, but uh, once the endotracheal tube is put, whether you if you want to check whether the leak is there or no, spirometry if it is available, it becomes a uh, you know quite rapid compared to the USG also. Right. Next question, Doctor. Is there uh, any uh, one point here. One, just want one very good query, ma'am. Somebody asked me also that time. Regarding the USG, it's not a three-dimensional picture of the trachea. When you do the USG, it gives you a two-dimensional picture. You may not be able to know all the depth and the parameters of the inside of the trachea also. So that's become very difficult with the USG to accurately assess the size, shape of the trachea. Yeah, especially and posterior and part, posterior and part, posterior part especially. And smaller the child, it is more difficult comparatively. If your machine has a spirometry, it gives you a very quick thing. Means if the loop is not complete, pressure volume loop, you know that there is a leak. Can we go to the next question? Yeah. Somebody is asking. The cost of Microsoft uh, Microsoft tube. Anita Madam has mentioned it is 1,400. Maya, madam, has mentioned it is 850. So yeah, it depends, ma'am. It depends. It, it ranges from 750 to, to 1500. The smaller yes. tubes might be 850, but uh, nowadays I think they have hiked the cost. It is uh, 1400. And uh, the it's available with the name Avnos. Now Kimberly Clark has uh, stopped. So yeah. It depends, you know. Uh, the government sector may get it at a costlier rate, ma'am, if I may submit. True. Yeah, uh, there's one thing uh, that uh, both sides of the what, what are the sir, uh, Sadie, sir, what are the pressure guidelines for the cuff pressure for the pediatric patients? That is very common. Uh, as you know, the um, most studies have been done in adult. The capillary perfusion pressure is 20 to 22 millimeters of mercury. So less than 20 centimeter of water is the recommendation. The range is 20 to 25. But it is preferable to keep it less than 20 because Dr. Yes, Anila also, ma'am, has very correctly mentioned in babies, you know, the uh, our uh, systolic, diastolic and the mean arterial are much lower. So less than 20 centimeter of water would be the safer way to go. So if I may add, uh, in neonates, usually we see uh, the pressure as the mean gestational age. So if it's a 36 weeker, we would assume that you know the pressures unless the baby is in sepsis it would yeah. be further down so down. 10 to 15 is 
what I would say for neonates yes. and smaller infants, 10 to 15 centimeters of water cuff pressure. And the micro cuff does give you that kind of very low pressure. And that's why we say do not use the other cuff because that will never give you a low cuff pressure. So don't exceed 20, you know. That's don't the... exceed 20 at all, at all. And as Anila Madam said, it will increase further. And if you're using nitrous, it's going to just burst out. So uh, be very mindful of the cuff pressure. Uh, with nitrous, every hour you have to check religiously, minimum. And sir, I wanted to know that how frequently you deflate the cuff in case of a cuff tube in an intraoperative setting. How frequently you should deflate the cuff actually? Uh, you don't uh, deflate it, ma'am. Yes. Intra you, don't, you don't deflate it. You, know, don't deflate. Okay. Don't. you just uh, check it regularly. Okay. You check it so, regularly. Yeah, the pressure keep it between is exceeding, 10 to 20, 10 to 20 centimeter of water. Then you have to deflate. If the pressure is exceeding, you do need to yeah. deflate. Yeah. When we did a project with this micro cuff tube, whenever the pressure exceeded, we did have to we do have to deflate. Yeah. And uh, mean, if you regularly, if you are monitoring cautiously, especially the research setting, when you are monitoring. Every 10 minutes, the cuff pressure, you are noting down when you're measuring continuous cuff pressures and all. So it does, even in a one-hour surgery, it does increase. Always. So that is a practical experience out of research project that we have got. Always. That it does increase. It and we do require to deflate. Yeah. By uh, deflation, I meant not complete deflation. Not complete. You, you have to reduce the air. That reduce allow the pressure. Air. You have to reduce the air. Anita, there is a case scenario which uh, yeah, I think yeah. is an interesting case yes. scenario. Uh -huh. yeah, can we just Saurav read it? Sarkar. Please read. Yeah. Please read. Yeah, yeah. So, shall I? Yeah, so, this, this session is being organized at the best possible time. Kindly help. One, I have a three years old 10 kg male baby due to the maxillofacial surgery day after. Needs nasal intubation. Mouth opening is just one finger. One finger. We do have pediatric, we do uh, have. not have pediatric fiber optic bronchoscope. I plan to do a blind intubation with an armored curve tube with the rocuronium and sugamadex on standby. Anything else that any of you would dif do differently, kindly suggest. So anything, ma'am, Anila, ma'am, would you like to answer that? Uh, yeah, see now, mouth opening is only one finger and this is a maxillofacial surgery. For intubation, I would take under deep under because it's a baby, so obviously will not allow awake intubation. We need to do under inhalational anesthesia intubation. So without initial paralysis, obviously the intubation should be done. So I would not uh, give any uh, kind of uh, muscle relaxant to this baby. Take the deeply patient under and then when the patient is spontaneously breathing, Attempt whichever way you want to do that uh, blind nasal also. You can try it out. And uh, don't paralyze till your endotracheal tube is in and you have confirmed that it is in it. I would not paralyze. And ma'am, there's no new need of using a reinforced tube unless you're increasing the tube size out of diameter. It's very in difficult. Nasal intubation, you really don't In pediatric cases, especially, reinforced tube is, is just a, like a nightmare of it will Not traumatize required. the it will traumatize the nose. It do you have bad. adult? Do you have a 3.5 mm tube at least? I have not seen it. No, no. I have not seen any time. So I mean, uh, yeah, pediatric goes up to 2.2. But if you have a 3.5 or a 4, if you can pass it through the other nostril and under vision instead of blindly, under spontaneous always, you can pass it under vision. If you have a little bigger if you don't have any bronchoscope, then uh, I wonder why you want to do. You know, sir, why, why not refer the patient risk? to higher center? Absolutely. Exactly. Definitely, definitely. It may not that be a good idea to take up that risk. Yeah, it may not yeah. be a good idea without yeah. the bronchoscope. It is very without dangerous. bronchoscope. It is dangerous. Yes, it yes. is very dangerous. So, uh, I think uh, they are all answered. The next questions. One comment is there. Very interesting comment. Huh, Don't you can spend read time with USG for pediatric airway. Only academic interest at present. 
really very succinct comment somewhat true somewhat true also yes. somewhat true yes it is true, true. true. Oh, i yes. i did try i did a lot of airway ultrasound so i did try inflating the cuff deflating the cuff just to see whether i can see the cuff so it's subtle i mean uh, i won't uh, take it to decision making i won't use it for decision making it's a long a little bit of imagination also a little bit of imagination goes there so i won't use uh, to decide whether the cuff is at the right place or no. there is another case scenario okay another case scenario can you see dr rasapna did you see that uh, I'll read it if you don't. Ha, yeah, it. please do yeah. that. Please do yeah. that. It's actually chat box is now full and flooded full. with the questions. Yeah, question. yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, good evening, ma'am. I have a doubt. Yeah. During awake extubation, child cups. Some say cup causes spasm to give propofol. Then child will be sedated. Again, while extubating the awake child, again he cups because of the tube inside. Is it safe to extubate while the child is cupping for awake extubation? And in mm-hmm. adenotonsillectomy, sudden uh, surgeon says cuff causes bleeding. Still, awake extubation is safest. We say generally. Can you please clear this? Yes, see, Raki, what, madam. What I Anila, madam, yeah. Uh, see what I advise all my trainees is whenever, uh, like even if we have used muscle relaxants, everything, and when we are extubating endotracheal tube, when the baby is trying to cry on the tube vigorously trying to move all four limbs i tell them please wait for some time don't stimulate let the baby uh, sort of settle down then when the baby is again having a when smooth breathing that time you gently remove the endotracheal tube that doesn't cause the laryngospasm and all that but whenever baby is trying to cry on the tube trying to actively move all four limbs at that time when you are trying to remove the endotracheal tube you know invariably immediately baby goes in that either coughing spell or you know all this kind of uh, breath holding spell that happens so instead of that i always tell them please allow the baby to settle down never ever try immediately after oral suctioning remove the endotracheal tube never try that you do complete thorough suction everything when the baby stops again you gradually moving and baby is having a nice quiet regular respiration without crying attempt gently remove the endotracheal tube and this practically helps out yes but actually uh, i what i want to say is what happens in head neck surgery or surgeries where you know there is a lot of movement of the cuff tube or uncuff tube occurring against the larynx all throughout the surgery the movement is occurring because the head neck surgery is going on and the surgeon is moving the head like in cleft lip palates also the surgeon is adjusting the head so what happens if this child you try to extubate awake the child always starts coughing very 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 vigorously and you just cannot extubate this child who already has a uh, you know uh, the irritated larynx and uh, this child you cannot extubate many times awake so it helps to extubate them deep that's what he is asking that the child is uh, i mean you are giving propofol again to prevent spasm again child is coughing and this is a again adenotonsillectomy he is saying so it is a head neck where there is i just want to uh, make one comment i also agree with anila ma'am whenever the child is coughing there is a reflex to take the tube out that you have to definitely yes. hold it and secretions if you think because adenotonsil or all the facial maxil surgeries have secretion and blood that is very uh, potent for laryngospasm so try to do suction when the child is deep mostly i have seen with the resident the child become very awake is coughing they are trying to you know suction and take yes. the tube out and they land up into laryngospasm so it's a very nicely said by arila ma'am please don't tend to do take the tube out just wait patience no yes of course you have to do suction when the child is deep there is no doubt about that but it happens that somehow you cannot take out the patient light enough or awake enough because the child continues to cough this happens sometimes ma'am you can have a lignocaine spray also before uh, starting this also help in preventing the cough so the anecdotal all the evidence is less but some people do it some superior laryngeal block or some sort of spray to suppress the coughing 
or but, some people give intravenous uh, lignocaine that is yeah, smart just exactly. before extubation uh, it is uh, also practiced by some to give intravenous xylocard to prevent this cup uh, so i think important is to anticipate dr sethi sir yeah ma'am uh, i agree with dr anila the first time the baby coughs is not the right time to extubate so after the first cough when he just starts waking up wait and after some time you'll find the respiration becomes smoother the coughing will become less so before that you should have done your suctioning after that you just wait the first cough just keep waiting once he starts moving his head responding opening his eyes that's the time to extubate not the first time so you have to wait and uh, don't take the surgeons too seriously you know they're all you know i mean uh, there's a right time for him to wait outside i think you know that's or, the best <laughs> advice <laughs> So one more question is there: Is the lignocaine jelly lubricating on the tube advisable? So, sir, would you like to continue with this? Yeah, uh, normally uh, lubricate jelly. What happens is it it, uh, it forms you know the it forms channels. It tends to get uh, inspissated or encrusted. So generally, I don't personally use any lignocaine jelly on the tube. Even in adults and in babies, both so no lignocaine jelly because they tend to encrust and may cause trauma for all you know. And channeling, okay. I think it's a good idea. To not to I don't know, ma'am. Are you using lignocaine jelly, ma'am? I agree with uh, uh, City sir. At least in children, we shouldn't be using. Very simple thing because you know sometimes. See, uh, instead of just wiping off the jelly, many times people would apply a lot of jelly, and that would form a plug sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, at the time of extubation, if in a small baby, if it is just sitting on the um, larynx, it it would be a cause of laryngospasm. So it becomes you know more of an mm -hmm. problem. So I said no. If at all, like for a nasal, obviously nasal tube, you may have to lubricate ah, and yeah. wipe it off Correct. properly. Yeah, lubrication, yes. Yeah, lubrication for nasal, we always do, ma'am. But otherwise, yeah, but no. just wipe it off. It should yeah. not be uh, poured on the thing and then you put it, then it can be, you know, at the time of extubation, that small yeah. plug of lignocaine jelly also would be causing a problem. Correct. And if you don't so want one, to do, just wipe off with the saline, even saline would act as a lubricant rather than, you know, having something yeah. solid gel. So, uh, in go, uh, lubricating the cough over the tube is uh, gone other days. We were doing it earlier, but now uh, we are not practicing anymore, listening to the discussion by the senior people. Yeah. So, this is another question. Uh, I have a doubt. Actually, I think we have already discussed this cases, adenotonsillectomy and all. Okay. Majority of the questions have been answered. I have think. been asked. Uh, just scrolling, sir. If anything which is left unanswered or which is the unanswered is what to use in the periphery, cuffed or uncuffed. <laughs> that we have already discussed, <laughs> and I think the message is not conveyed. <laughs> yeah. Now conveyed. Uh, uh, we have discussed and reinforced n number of times over the same point, so that there should be some crisp answer coming out of this crisp series. So no, that uh, one is thing I can sense. one thing I can conclude from this discussion, just like Dr. Miller has said in his book, uh, in his Miller textbook, he commented upon ketamine. It's a very drug, very good drug to have with you, unless until you don't use it. So similarly, I would say the cuff tube is also a very good tube to have with you, unless you use it judiciously. Yeah. Another the last question I think is remaining is. Uh, what about using lycoparillate in pediatric anesthesia? Yeah, we are discussing so much about secretions. Yeah. Uh, Lyco, we routinely use lycoparillate, ma'am. Especially yeah. if uh, if you're um, you know uh, using uh, if you have to give scoline, majority of the times uh, we use glycopyrrolate. In fact, atropine I personally haven't used for years now. But uh, glycopyrrolate, yes, definitely we are using. It's a good idea. Anila, yeah. Yeah. especially yeah. airway surgeries, as anti silagog and the airway surgeries. Otherwise, rest of the surgery slowly we are coming out. We are not giving any anti silagogs. But wherever uh, like uh, airway surgeries are there, then it is going to produce more secretions. It is better to use uh, anti silagog and glycoparlate we use. Yeah. 
unless it's a neonate there we are using atropine right and besides airway surgeries madam any other in, uh, all the other surgeries are you must not be using it routinely no it shouldn't be used it shouldn't be used yeah i think all the all the questions in the chat box are over yes yeah. only the repeated are there repeated questions are there question question the almost all have been answered yeah. almost all have been answered yeah thank you yeah so i feel uh, madam do you want to say something anila madam you are saying something no no yeah so uh, the first topic i think the ideas are very clear now that in a proper algorithmic way we have need to manage the laryngospasm in pediatric patients of course the use of muscle relaxant like succinylcholine is safe in an emergency situation when the baby is hypoxic and cyanosed the second topic yes i don't think as dr rakhi said that the debate is over looking at the questions in the chat box but the important message that that is there that when we talk about cuff tubes it should be micro cuff tubes and uh, not the pvc or the portex cuff tubes which are routinely available so better to avoid those tubes and go for uncuff tubes as many seniors like asit vishnu sir dr navdeep sir and anila madam has already said that they have not seen any patients who had aspirated in this uh, their long clinical practice so i think uh, uh, this, this was a excellent uh, this is a excellent take up message for the today's uh, webinar yeah somebody has asked about what age regular cuff tubes can be safely used if micro cuff tube is not available i would say about 7 years of age at least more than 6 7 years of age yeah yeah right so it's the time to sum up we had a wonderful discussion over last one and a half hour and i think we have also come up with certain conclusions dr manisha has also said so over to you dr manisha for the summing up yeah yeah i think i have summed up everything dr bajwa you have to say something and otherwise dr manoj will be doing the formality of vote of thanks dr bajwa sir dr manoj always closes the session he is the right person to close the session but i think whatever the discussion took today is a wonderful uh, because you know the attempt from the isa national is that the practitioners and the academicians coming on the same platform discussing the evidence based subjective experience based discussion because everything is not book everything is not academic you just can't go to journals you can't go to books to define in india we are doing the maximum case in the world the maximum number of surgeries are happening in india whatever the evidence we are accumulating we are not reporting we are not you know doing for the research purpose also we a majority of times the practitioner does just doing it for the bread and butter so majority of times our data just go missing just go in the drain we are not coming up with a good conclusions what is the best say uh, just like uh, i asked for a 30 years uh, plus experience with uh, anila ma'am and uh, sethi sir because it's very difficult during our practice to come to devise a devise a study for such a long period but in definitely in cases of pediatric they are very tricky the speakers have done a wonderful job the moderators then excellently and uh, our chair person they are always to the point and the questions were answered beautifully and i think our purpose is solved today what i can feel here the purpose is solved today many questions have been answered where the people have encountered those difficulties during their practice during their Uh, conduct of anesthesia i think many things have been answered today so right i think uh, it has given us some more feedback some more uh, the food for thought to go ahead for the next crisp and the next clip for all the academic even for the pg classes also it, it has given us a good food of thought for that i think wonderful discussion i really thank everyone and i would like to hear from our manoj bhai uh, he has to because <laughs> mere, i have got a amnesia he doesn't have that's the only thing because a treasurer he cannot even forget single penny so i have to ask him for this conclusion of this webinar thank you bajwa uh, dr bajwa uh, thank you isa national for giving me a opportunity for vote of thanks i am very thankful to isa national president dr mp vimeshwar sir for his blessing support and guidance my sincere thanks to isa national vice president dr mahesh kumar sinha sir and isa national president elect dr jb tibetia sir for 
uh, their support and guidance. I am very thankful to ICA National Dynamic Secretary Dr. Sukhvinder Ji Singh Vajba for his untiring day night effort for the upliftment of, of our ICA. So my sincere thanks to ICA National Academy Chairman Dr. Benkat Giri KM Sir for his tremendous support and guidance for this academic activity of ISA. I am very thankful to immediate past secretary, Dr. Naveen Malhotra sir, for his hard work and Dr. Virendra Sarma sir for his support and guidance. I am very, my sincere thanks to today ISA CRISP series two chairperson, Dr. Anila ma'am, Anila Malde madam and Dr. Major General Navdeep Sethi, sir, they shared their experience and knowledge with us for the such a difficult airway uh, management in the infant and children. I am very thankful to the today I say CRISP series to all the speaker, Dr. Ritima Sarma, ma'am, Dr. Suman Lata Gupta, ma'am, Dr. Rakhi Goel, ma'am, for their excellent presentation. For uh, which was very beneficial to our all the member of the ISA, especially private practitioners. My sincere thanks to today ISA Chris Series Academic Moderator, Dr. Anita Nehte, Madam, and Dr. Sapna Bhatia, Madam, for moderating such a wonderful uh, manner. I express my deep sense of independentness to the program head. Dr. Chintala Kishan sir and Dr. Manisha Kartikar madam for their great effort and organize the this series in a very right way. And thank, thankful to all the office bearer of ISA, state branch, city branch, all the past president of ISA National and all the member of ISA, uh, Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. Long live ISA. Thank you. Over to uh, Dr. Sipala, you, you just end the session now. It's your turn to end the session. You being a program head for these all. So over to Manisha. <laughs> Thank you all. all. Yeah, yeah. Already the already Dr. Manish Kumar has ended the special, but I want to again specially thank Anila Madam and Navdeep sir for their special in inputs, as well as Dr. Rakhi and Dr. Suman Lata and uh, Dr. Ridima. For, for the great uh, helping for the great discussion and of course dr anita and dr safna it was great moderation thank you very much thank you and so let's let's move on to the yeah let's move on to the next after 15 days we'll have another interesting topic yeah. the isaac history so let's say good night it's 8 35 okay. and uh, yeah. thank you very much for giving us this opportunity thank you sir. Uh, no sir it's a uh, our privilege that you were there it's our privilege you and ma'am are there it was an honor and a privilege for me thank you yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, you. dr bajwa <laughs> and whole team dr manisha anita everyone thank you ma'am thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that platform yeah come on ma'am uh, let's ma say good night to everyone